Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the fourth and final webinar of IT Leadership, a short course presented by IT Masters on behalf of Charles Sturt University. My name is Guy Coward and I'm IT Masters short course MC. Your course mentor is the governance ATA, Brenton Birchmore, who will take over soon, hopefully with a poor Austrian accent. Wherever and whenever you are watching this, we hope you are safe and well and six feet from the nearest person. Thanks as ever to Hannah, who makes these short courses possible and looks after the, the course page, the learn.itmasters.edu.au website. You can find all the course materials there, um, links to readings and tasks and Brenton's amazing audio lectures, discussion forums and quizzes, and the course exam and certificate soon. Um, we'll talk about those as long as you need later. So please hold your questions. Um, we'll, we'll be waxing lyrical later in the evening. Eastern Time, Oz. As ever, using Zoom for our webinars allows us to encourage questions and the use of chat during our sessions. We ask that you direct all questions relevant to Brenton's content to the Q&A section and that you send all course administration questions to Hannah in the chat. You can chat with IT Masters folk directly, we're designated as panellists, or to everyone listening along live. And you can make that choice by toggling through the drop down box once you've opened the chat log. We'll have a, a long Q&A session at the end of the webinar. And as usual, I'll interrupt Brenton if a question seems particularly relevant. Uh, Brenton is talking about governance. Um, it looks like mostly according to the Osaka frameworks, um, COVID-5 and COVID-19, I think they call it. It may shock you to hear that Brenton is an expert in this subject and wrote the subject uh, that this short course corresponds to. Hello, dear Brenton, for the last time for now, thank you as ever for, for I guess, lending your time to these little projects. How, how are the youth coping stuck with, with the parentals uh, Singapore way? How are you coping? Coping well. Uh, it's, it's something that we've become sufficiently accustomed to that we can get by from day to day. And uh, we're able to somewhat escape, or at least I am. Uh, I have a home office. <laughs> I was blessed with already working from home years ago so mm. I got the designated office space in the in the house. You cheeky bugger. And yeah, so everyone else is having to make do. And I got to hang on to it because of wonderful things like this course, for which, of course, I can't be interrupted. So <laughs> it is, it is uh, to my advantage, uh, of course, but we are getting by. And uh, although today is public holiday and uh, everyone's having a good time, relaxing a little bit, taking things a little bit easier. Uh, around this way so only a few weeks left in the uh, international year international school calendar uh, because uh, my well for my son he's in the the ib curriculum so he's gonna have two months with nothing to it well he'll have a lot to do mm. but uh, no school work so oh, that'd be, that. yeah well good <laughs> is it is it common in singapore to go through the ib no, the local system tends to use, so most of the local system tends to use a modified version of what was originally the British system. So it's, it's evolved a little bit. Uh, there are many schools that do the IB curriculum, but it's not the most common. Okay. Right. Um, we're getting a lot of feedback that your audio is quite quiet compared to mine, Brenton. So either I'm shouting, which is ah, entirely possible. Um, okay. Let me adjust. How did I sound to you before? So you seemed fine to me, but I had me my I had me volume turned up all the way. So um. let me do a quick check of my audio settings. Tim, that's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me in the chat. You seem normal, guy. <laughs> uh, I imagine you're actually talking about okay. the audio, but um, you know, you take what you can get. All right. Um, <laughs> He is normal. Uh, I can hear you both okay. Quieter. I'm going to turn the gain up a little bit. I'm going to see if that makes it. Oh, that, yeah, that that's nice. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's sounding a bit louder. All right. Okay. Sounds, if I'm oh, yeah. sounding good for somebody, then, okay, so this is better. All right, good, good. Thank you for that feedback. We have made some adjustments and hopefully that's better. And I'll make sure I stay close enough to the microphone but I've just turned a little bit of gain up. Sounding better, all right, good. Okay, 
Uh, Guy, are we ready to kick off? Uh, shall I? Let's do it? it. Let's do yeah? it. All right. Uh, I'm going to, oh, we've already got a great question and I'm going to answer it uh, at the appropriate slide, Amit. So we will get to that because uh, we're going to be talking about the pyramid according to ISO IEC 38500. Now, tonight might get a little bit more technical. And part of the reason for that is that I want to share with you a little bit of how something like the COVID framework that we're going to dip into and the glimpse along the way, how it can offer practical guidance. How does it really do that? And in order to help get that point across, we are going to have a look at some things that are going to look a bit complicated on the slide. And part of that is because we're not going to be able to cover all of the things leading up to that. So if some of what we get to at the end starts to look big and complicated, it's only just to give you an example of what the core ingredients are. So if you just focus on that part of it, and get an understanding of what the bits and pieces are. Any of you who wish to go a bit further and dig a little bit deeper, you'll find that there are free resources that you can get. And I'll point you to those in a moment. Now, a starting point for this, our syllabus, uh, I'm gonna pull this up quickly. This is what we've been talking about week to week. We are at week four. We are going to talk about governance. We are gonna talk about the three pillars, which is the, the pyramid. We are gonna talk about how those things all come together. And we are going to talk also about where COBIT fits in relation to a couple of other frameworks. So you get a bit of an idea as to where it kind of works with other things. So hopefully we'll be able to give you that information. So what are we going to cover today? We're going to talk about the core of what is governance? What's it really mean? Try to demystify it a little bit and break a few myths that might some of you might have heard of. We're going to talk about COBIT what it is, where it's positioned, what it's trying to do for us, what it might do for us. We're going to talk about the core model within COBIT, which is the big thing, the big piece of what COBIT offers. And we're going to, as usual, talk about a little bit of synergy of how that works with the other topics when we get to the end. Now, when you listen to any of the pre-recorded audio or when you talk about governance and COBIT, it's often going to be talked about the governance of enterprise IT. Now, I don't want to put the idea out there that it's only suitable for the big end of town. A complete governance framework that's bolted on and does everything just right, that might be something that only the big organizations will do or can afford to do. But what they're doing with a big governance framework is they're making absolutely sure because of the scale of their operation. The principles of what governance is trying to do for any organization are just as applicable all the way down to small enterprise and small businesses. But what tends to happen is that small businesses tend to have less risk. They tend to have a shorter cyclic feedback of how the strategy informs IT because quite often a couple of people involved are sitting near each other. And so, there often appears to be less need for a governance framework. That might be true, but those clever people that are in those roles for small to medium businesses that are making the big decisions, the more they know about what governance as a concept is meant to do for them and for their IT. So the more that leadership understands the role of governance, the more empowered they are to be able to make sure that whatever their role and function is within IT and the others around it, are doing enough to make sure that they're ticking the boxes and not being exposed to unnecessary risk. Now, here's a definition. Let's start with a definition because it's, you know, it's kind of dry and crusty. So we'll begin with that and then we'll try and make sense of it as we go on. It's a couple of key points to draw out of this. It's a subset of a corporate governance. It begins at the very top of the governance that says, what is this corporation? What is this business here to do? And how do we make sure it does that? So we've, we know about corporate governance. It's about keeping people honest at the top to some extent. And that's a lot of what we hear about in the news because what we see in the news is when it doesn't quite work that well. Well, governance of enterprise IT or IT governance is a subset of that. It's what flows from that corporate governance. So it is all of the things that information technology systems 
and their performance and their risk management need. So primary goal is to assure the investments are doing the right things. That's a key point. Ensure that they generate value, that they mitigate the risks associated with IT. Doing the right things, not doing the wrong things. So this means that a big part of what governance is there to do is to align the strategy of IT with the strategy of the organization. Have you ever had those moments where IT seems to do its own thing, seems to come up with its own ideas, uh, spend money on things, deliver things, and maybe deliver things that some parts of the organization really want and really value, but are they really worth it to the entire organization? Are they the right things to go in the right direction? Are we meant to be innovating bleeding edge and taking innovative risks, or are we meant to be playing it safe and not taking those risks? This is where a governance framework is meant to inform all of that so that whatever the decisions that get made, the big decisions that get made in IT are in alignment with that strategy. So the organization will have needs. It'll have expectations of what IT is there to do for the organization. And this is going to be different for every organization, for every industry. But whatever those requirements are, it's important that the IT department knows what those expectations are and that it meets those objectives or can meet those objectives. Now, this is going to mean everyone involved needs to be fairly clear on what their role is, what's their contribution, what are they responsible for, what are they accountable for, what decisions should they be involved in, what decisions do they support, what decisions do they make, what outcomes are they meant to be involved in. And having that clarity is, again, a way of making sure that things don't fall through the cracks because you have less cracks. You have things that are clearly allocated. And when you've allocated everything, then in theory, none of it can actually be lost. It also means that the big corporate strategy, which I've just implied is the lead and that IT is the tail that gets wagged, it's actually a cycle. So the governance framework is a way to help that top executive leadership listen to what happens and what goes on in IT so that when they make the strategic decisions that say this is what we need from IT, they make some of those decisions with an IT lens, with a, an IT perspective or with the benefit of what IT can inform on those big decisions. So it's about managing the risks and delivering the value that's required. Here are the big key areas of governance uh, of enterprise IT according to the Governance Institute. And these are widely accepted. So these, these five areas, we'll spell them out here. There's strategic alignment, which we've mentioned, making sure that the strategy within IT is aligned with the strategy of the corporation above it. Ensuring that value is delivered to the customers of IT, which could be internal and external. Ensuring that resources are managed correctly. So that's ensuring there's no wastage and ensuring that risks are managed correctly. And lastly, that performance is measured so that we know that we're doing it well enough. The three most important, the three biggest, the three that form the majority of what we typically do or what governance typically does is these. So when we're talking about a governance system, the majority of what's going to go on with that is going to be about how do we make sure we deliver value? How do we make sure we manage resources and manage the risks? So those are the, the three, that's the, the, the triumvirate, that's the three components that are always going to be key in any governance framework. So let's talk about this from a more relaxed perspective. What's the sort of thing is governance there to prevent or avoid? It's meant to prevent uh, investing in an IT project that we really shouldn't have, that had to get shut down because it was the wrong thing, the wrong project. Now you could go back to what we've talked about in previous weeks and say, well, hang on, was that, could that have been a business analysis failure to not get the correct needs? Well, maybe, but who informed the BA of what our strategy was? 
And it could be a failure of project management where the project went off the rails. Well, maybe, but who informed the project of what the constraints were upon the project that they needed to meet? Governance is meant to be informing all those stakeholders about what's expected. It's also to avoid losing resources that we need. If a particular system is needed to do a particular thing, you want to make sure that you're protecting the resources and that you know that those resources are delivering that service and that that is fundamental to the strategy that we're on so that they don't get reappointed, repurposed, lost, made redundant or whatever happens to those things. Sometimes an old system that gets replaced, but we keep the old one for a while, right? We've been through that in IT a few times. We've got a shiny new one, but there's still you know, six people that are using the old one and we can't seem to stop that. That under an IT strategy might be the right thing to do or it might be a waste. So you get a mechanism that says we need to uninvest in this because we've invested in that and dual investment is not profitable for us. Or choosing the wrong thing, meeting the wrong needs, meeting the wrong goals. Or what about a rapid change? changing the goalposts, changing what we're here to do. When the decisions are driven reactively, when they're driven by customers each month coming along and say, oh, can you do this for us, IT? IT says, well, I guess we could. Uh, should we? Well, why shouldn't we? Well, controlling that is meant to be the governance system. Also ensuring that we don't have failures or risks of failure that we shouldn't really have. Those potentially catastrophic things that we often see in the news from time to time that we don't want to be in the news, not for something that was a major failure that we could have prevented if we'd been checking enough things. Governance is a way of making sure that we check enough things. And when we check and we get answers that say something's not right, something happens about that. It doesn't just go into a list of things that we don't have to worry about it today, so maybe one day, and of course that means never. Or decision makers that are running their own agenda, running their own strategy, running their own plan. A governance system helps make sure that the decisions that leadership makes is aligned with a more complete picture, the one that we're all aligned with, so that we can all make decisions effectively. Now this raises a question often about What's then the difference between governance and management? Can you do all these sorts of things within a management paradigm? In small business, typically you do because it's compressed and you don't often have additional separate resources for governance. But what you do have is separate decisions about governance, even if they're made by the leadership within a small to medium business. But there's still the distinction between governance and management. So let's look at them both. Governance is it helps make sure that the stakeholders have a strategy and an organized discussion about that strategy that makes everyone's goals clear. Management is about managing the resources, the application, the tactical decisions, the planning, the building, the creating, the doing, the managing, the organizing. It's how we go about meeting the goals. That's management. What are the goals and are they the right ones? That's governance. So we get a little bit of a difference between them. And we often find that if you're stuck in the day-to-day -day of solving management's problems, you often don't have a lot of time left over to think about next week, next quarter, next year's problems or risks. Governance is a way of making sure that somebody somewhere, somehow sets aside time, effort, resources to make those determinations, make those decisions check those parameters, check for those risks, so that we're not just flying by the seat of our pants and we're crashing into something next quarter, next year, that we really could have seen coming. Now, underpinning IT governance is an ISO IAC standard. It's a guidance standard. So it's not like ISO 20,000, which is going to tell us thou shalt do it this way because we're going to certify you. You don't get certified with ISO 38500, but you do get some guiding principles. And some of them are quite interesting. Now, what this is telling us is as an international standard, 
we need to consider all these principles in considering a governance system or to be governed. Right? One of the things is you need to know who is responsible for what. People who are responsible need to be clearly made aware of it. They need to know it. They need to accept it. You need to have a strategy. Now, if you're so small that you're really making it up as you go along, then maybe you're not going to have a strategy to work with. But even a medium organization needs to have some kind of strategic planning. You need to understand what you're spending your IT money on. Making sure that those investments, the acquisition of IT and IT services is appropriate. Making sure that the performance of those IT services is appropriate. Appropriate to what? Appropriate to the strategies, requirements and expectations, the goals. Also the conformance. Now for a lot of people when I mentioned or when others mention governance, a lot of what people will immediately think of is compliance. Well, compliance is just a little piece of what a complete IT governance system would look like. It is a piece and it's an important piece in the ISO standard as well, but it's just a piece. And of course we have to have this. We have to have the thing that makes sure that we obey the laws that are relevant to our business. But then there's this last one, which is one of my favorites because IT governance as an ISO standard is telling us, well, it's all great that you've got all this stuff sorted out, but don't forget you're dealing with people here. You're dealing with human beings and they are flawed, they are fickle and they make mistakes. And a governance system needs to be aware of that and take that into account and have some checks and balances. Have things like auditing that doesn't rely on any single point of failure as an individual person. So within 38500, and this is the, going back to the question that I think Amit was asking about, the pyramid. ISO 38500 tells us there are three fundamental components of what we do when we make governance decisions. And it's these three. Evaluate, direct, and monitor. You can see that there's a bunch of pressures coming in from the outside. There's a bunch of influencing factors. And the governing body is at the top of the organization. It's not just the board. It's going to include technological or IT people. But there will be a governing body that will make the big decisions. They will provide strategy and policies down to the management component. They will get feedback that they will evaluate. And they'll be monitoring the performance to adapt the strategy as needed based on the performance of how things are going. So this is an ongoing, never-ending cycle. Let's look at it in a bit more detail. Evaluate, consider all of the external pressures and consider the internal feedback and pressures internally. Consider everything. Direct means create goals, goals that can be understood, translated, adopted by IT. Make sure that you have metrics for those goals. So we know and they know and everyone knows whether or not they're being met so that when they're not, something can be done about it. And monitor through automation and through proactive intervention, monitor the performance of IT as it's meant to be achieving those metrics so that you always have a way of knowing at any point in time how close or far we are from achieving the important goals. That's the reason IT exists here. So we're saying it's pretty important that we know what IT is meant to do for the organization and how it's doing in regards to that. Now that's the high level holistic view. Once we start to go a little bit further, we start to get into a little bit more detail. We start to focus on specific things. One of the things that we talked about is risk. It's one of the key factors. When it comes to risk, we're talking about uncertainty because risk can be positive or negative, but we're talking about anything we do, especially within IT, it has uncertainty. That needs to be dealt with. And it's not something that you plan once and then you're set. Risks will change. They will evolve. We will learn things about them as we go. So we need to be able to dynamically and iteratively evolve our risk plan. But it's the leaders, it's the decision makers 
that are the key to making sure that the decisions get made. It doesn't mean that the leaders need to know what all the risks are, but they need to know who to ask. And they need to make sure that they actually get asked, that that person, those people, get that input back into the decision-making. So that when our experts say, well, this is a risk, that gets taken into account. Leadership has to facilitate that. So with that constant feedback loop from what are the risks and from above, what are we trying to do? We find a balancing act that means we take just the right amount of risk for our risk appetite or our risk profile, but making sure that we are constantly evolving for new threats, new risks, and making sure there's transparency, there's visibility. We're not hiding information, we're not hiding facts. Because generally the reason why things get hidden, one of two things, they get overlooked, forgotten, considered unimportant, or they get hidden for personal and political reasons because somebody is going to be not wanting the bad news. Both of those are a threat to the success of the organization at the very top. And so governance is the tool used by the highest level of decision makers who have the highest level of accountability for the success of the organization to make sure that risks are being properly handled all the way through the organization. So ISO 3100, 31,000 is the risk management principle that we look at. And it's got a bunch of principles that are gonna sound pretty familiar. It says, integrate risk management with the organization, make sure that it's structured, all stakeholders have a role, comprehensive, get everybody's input, make sure it's customized, tailored, don't take a template format. Make sure that we are getting the input from all the stakeholders, making sure that it's dynamic and evolving, making sure that you're using the best of most reliable information that you have available. So that's recency and currency of information. And don't forget you're dealing with humans. So these are similar principles that we're trying to wrestle with. And any governance system is going to need to wrestle with all these kinds of ideas and issues and distill all of this into some kind of framework that gives us advice and guidance on what we need to think about, or at least the decisions that we might need to make. Lastly, don't rest on your laurels. Continually improve as we go. So what are the objectives? I highlighted the red ones before. I'll put them all up. Delivering value to the various stakeholders according to what the stakeholders of the organization need. Managing the resources and detecting and managing risk according to the risk appetite. Those are the objectives, the key objectives of what governance, a governance system is trying to achieve for us. So what are we doing? Let's break it down again into more practical terms. We're making all the right decisions and we're making sure that they all get made. We make sure that those decisions have and utilize all the right information. No decision is made ignorant or blind. We make sure therefore that we include all the right opinions. We get all of the stakeholders to share their thoughts, to share their ideas. Doesn't mean that they get disproportional influence. We still have to judge and evaluate the relative worth of every piece of advice, guidance and input or opinion, but we've got to make sure we don't miss any. We set the right goals out of all that and therefore we are doing and measuring the right activities, which then feeds back into the decision. So that's the loop. So in governance, we're making a bunch of decisions and those decisions need to be properly authorized by the right person who is accountable. And a governance system is going to have a a racy model that tells us who's responsible, who's accountable, what roles are applicable to what things. Making sure that it's informed, making sure that everyone's together. These are all of the parameters that good governance decisions need to have. Now, where does that fit with all the other things we've talked about? We've talked about ITIL. Here's the ITIL framework. And let me talk about this one first. COSO, the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations. This is from the Tradeway Commission. This, this blue thing at the top, that's corporate governance. That's things like the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. 
that's the things that make senior executives worry about whether or not they're going to go to jail because they've done the wrong thing. Well, yeah, maybe that's a little bit extreme, but we've, that's the stuff that reaches the news, right? That's the, the level of corporate governance across the organization, and it's the highest level. It doesn't tell you anything about how. There's our how parameter here, but it tells you what you absolutely have to do. Under that is COVID, which tells us a lot of the sorts of things we need to think about, the decisions we need to make, as in what decisions. Not a lot about how to do that, but what to make. Then you have InfoSec, 27,000 information security. You have ISO 9000, which is quality in general. And then ITIL here, which is gives you more of the how than you get from COVID. So introducing COVID, it has a bunch of principles. They're going to sound pretty familiar too. It has some basic concepts. It says, well, here's the components that we have. Uh, here's the design factors. Here's the gold cascade. We're going to briefly touch on those in a moment. It has a core model that is comprising of all of its core guidance, which we'll also touch on. These are the controlled objectives. That they are what are within the core model. It then has something about performance management, how we manage the processes and activities that we do. And it tells us that we need to tailor the system to meet our organization and it has some guidance on how to implement it. We're only gonna be looking at the first half of this and what we're gonna be talking about in the next few minutes. But it's not just about compliance. It's not just about, okay, here's the structure of the organization or here's the budget and here's what we want you to do with it. It's about making sure that IT has everything that it needs. So if IT is under-resourced or if it's overstretched, that's a failure of governance. That's where governance needs to be able to say, well, if we've got these goals that have been given to IT, we need to resource IT adequately in order to do that. Now, COVID as a system, it's not an easy thing to do. You're sitting quite high in that graphic that we looked at before. It's trying to be general enough uh, to be able to apply to any particular enterprise. It needs to be general enough that anybody can use it. But it also needs to have things that are codified and defined so that when we have different stakeholders talking about governance, we can use the same language. We have a glossary, we have a bunch of concepts that we can all understand equally and therefore work with them. Because one of the things that we've just talked about with governance is you need all the stakeholders having their say. And a codified framework helps them understand each other a little more easily. It needs to be giving you some practicalities, some specific activities that need to be performed, but then still able to be adopted by anyone of any scale. So it tries to take the tacit knowledge of what governance requires, codifies it so that we can all discuss it in the same way, and then frames it into activities that humans can understand and adopt and then apply. That's what it's trying to do. Here are the six principles that COBIT tells us we should have in a governance system. What do we mean by governance system being all the things that our organization has chosen to do and have in order to be governed? So these are the principles. COBIT says we need to provide stakeholder value. I'll go to the next slide because I'll go through them in more detail. Provide stakeholder value. We need to make sure that what IT governance is ensuring is that it's delivering value after taking everything into account and making sure of that, not hoping, not here's some goals. Gee, I hope we, I hope they deliver. You know, I, I, I hope they meet those KPIs. Well, we go beyond that to put checks and balances that help define how that's meant to be done and measured. But it's a holistic approach in that it's not entirely separate from the organization. It's, a part of what we do so that monitoring of the performance, monitoring of the activities can be done in real time, can be done as you go through the business as usual processes. It's got to be dynamic because it has to be prepared to respond to change. 
the goals might change. Our competitor does something exciting and we need to compete with that. And suddenly it might mean that a risk manifests, something goes terribly wrong somewhere and we need to adapt and re respond to that. So the system needs to be able to deal with these sorts of things that are unexpected. But it says we need to just have decisions made distinctly from management. And the main reason for that is, and this isn't separating the roles, this is separating the decisions. The reason is that when we're stuck in dealing with the decisions of today's problems and tomorrow's problems, and maybe next week's problems, next quarter's problems aren't really important for us to deal with right now. And we might not make those decisions right now. We'll, we'll make them later. When we have time, we can't wait until we have time for governance because then we don't have governance. We have that other thing, which is a lot of people call you know, reactive, uh, agile management or chaos is another word for it. You, you have that scenario where the risk really could be existential. You could have something that seriously undermines your ability to perform. So by separating the decision-making, we're saying, well, we're going to make sure that the governance decisions actually get made and not having them lost in the pressures of the day-to-day -day decision making. It says it's got to be tailored to the needs. Mainly that's because we know that COVID isn't going to give you the answer for every organization, uh, but it needs to be end to end across the whole department, all aspects of IT. You can't just govern the infrastructure and not govern service delivery. You govern all of IT, all the way from the highest level of decisions down to the individuals and the workforce that are working to deliver the results every day. So what's in it? COBIT says that we have these components. These ones and these ones are the most complex. The processes are the activities we do, but COBIT will give us guidance on all of these things. It'll give us input. It'll give us something to think about especially these two that I've highlighted with a red circle, but it'll give us guidance on organizational structures, the policies we need to do. And it'll give us this guidance on 40 different objectives. But how do we reach those objectives? How do we figure out what those are? That's where we take a couple of things into account. First, a list of design factors. I'll put all these up. These are just the sorts of things that are gonna affect any organization. And if you're deciding what you need to do and have in order to be governed, you need to take all these things into account. Now, at this level, you're probably looking at that and saying, well, that's, that makes sense. That's logical. That's kind of obvious. This is all the things we need to take into account. Having this in a governance framework means you don't miss one of them. You're not relying upon these to all be remembered or to have champions that say, hey, don't forget we take this into account. This one down here, this future factors, that's your catch-all, that's your crystal ball stuff, right? We always need a crystal ball to make the decisions that or to take into account the things we don't know yet. But in deciding what our goals are, taking all those design factors, all those parameters into account, we have to translate our goals. Now I've said that strategic alignment, you start with the highest level of goals, the enterprise goals, you end up at the bottom with particular governance objectives. So you go from all the way at the top to all the way at the bottom. Let's look at those steps in a little more detail, right? You have the stakeholder drivers and needs. This is the highest level of influence at the corporate level on the enterprise, not on IT, on the enterprise. Then you have from that, here's what our goals are. Goals like we need to expand into Asia. Goals like we need to compete with this organization because you know they're beating us too much. Goals like we need to increase our share price. We need to reduce our capitalization, all a bunch of other things. We need to Im impress our customers more, retain more customers. These are all goals that will translate into specifics. Underneath that, IT will say, well, what does that need to mean? So we have alignment goals that are the IT goals that are gonna help us understand what that means to, from an IT perspective. And that's gonna translate into specific objectives. When we talk about COBIT, we're talking about the acronym control objectives. It's these objectives that we're talking about, controlling these objectives, these 40. Now, 
the drivers, that comes from the balanced scorecard. This is the thing that was uh, created by Kaplan and Norton many years ago. A lot of businesses do use it. Uh, it's meant to frame the questions about what's, what matters to our organization. This is what we take into account when we're trying to decide what our corporate goals need to be. And this is a, a balancing act of these parameters. We balance customer satisfaction with our business efficiency and our uh, financial performance. We, we might be really efficient and making lots of money and our customers don't like us because, well, there could be some reasons behind that, right? And then there's the knowledge and innovation. And these are usually trade-offs. And amongst all of this, we find a balanced set of drivers and forces and influence that result in a proactive strategy. That's that part, that's this top bit. So then that points to enterprise goals. Now, interestingly in COBIT, COBIT has a list of 13 enterprise goals because it's a lucky number. So they used to be 17 then they've reduced it to 13. Here's some examples. Now, this is the balanced scorecard dimension. I've only put the first three up here. So there's, there's a few uh, that are in each category. I think the growth only has two, customers have four, uh, et cetera. So you see here, this is the enterprise goal, and this one comes up a lot, a portfolio of competitive products and services. There is an enterprise goal that says, we're gonna be selling the right stuff. And here's some example metrics. And with, these are examples. We might have slightly different wording or different metrics, but we gotta decide what that really is. And what this is, is an example that says, you're gonna have something that talks about your products and services. So this is still the enterprise level. That's enterprise goals. How does it look at the alignment goals? Well, it doesn't directly translate one for one. There are 13 alignment goals. Here's an example of what goals look like to IT from COVID. A financial goal, realizing the benefits from the investments. An example, percentage of investments which claim the benefits in the business case are met or exceeded. Well, to do that, you have to have a business case. Then you have to know how to measure the benefits. Then you have to be able to say, well, did we meet or exceed that? And if you're doing all that anecdotally, subjectively, ad hoc, then you're not effectively governed. You don't really know. You'll have some opinions, but you're not really able to be sure. And that's what governance is for, being sure. Here's another one, customer, delivery of services in line with business requirements. How do you know you're doing that? Well, you have to know what the business requirements of IT really are. And then you have to have metrics about whether or not you're doing that. That's the alignment goals. Brings us down to the objectives at the bottom. These are the 40 objectives that the COVID model, the core model entails. Now you probably can't read them. Uh, we're gonna talk about a, a couple in a moment. This group at the top up here, this is the governance domain. This is referred to as EDM, evaluate, direct and monitor. And that's what this is doing. It says, ensure that you have a, a framework, ensure benefits delivery, ensure risk optimization, ensure resource optimization, ensure stakeholder engagement. That's your governance framework. Underneath that, all this stuff below is all the management activity that this is governing. So this is governing all this stuff below, but we still break it down. This blue stuff, the management stuff, we break down into this domain. These ones here, 14 of them, align, plan and organize. This is the top level decisions that we make. This is like making sure that we have a strategy we're managing innovation, we're managing risk, we're managing security, data, human resources, uh, managing our vendors, uh, we're managing our relationships, service agreements. This is the high level management of how do we make sure we've got all of the things and systems in place. At this layer, we're actually building stuff, build, acquire and implement. Here you have project management. That's, that's what project, that's where it lives. This is where stuff comes to life in IT. So you've got manage organizational change, manage IT change, manage configuration, manage assets, projects, manage the knowledge of the organization, managing programs. This is where you do all the activity that brings things to life. And this is IT service management. This, this DSS, this is ITIL. This is where ITIL is. So this is project management and this is where ITIL lives. Yeah, ITIL does this too, right? ITIL tells us, 
how to implement and deploy, which is, which is great. But when we think about service delivery, that's what we're thinking about and talking about. So manage continuity, making sure that uh, business controls over here, monitor, evaluate, and assess. This is the feedback loop. This is the stuff where we're checking, monitoring, feeding back up to the governance domain when we make the decisions about what to change. We've provided direction down here. We've provided goals. We've provided policy. And we get this information over here to feedback to decide when we need to alter, alter that, change it, adapt it, update it. So that's the model. We're going to have a look at a couple of things in a little more detail, just because I want to give you an example of what it looks like. Those of you, for, for, if you because you're not able to read the, the fine print, here's the short lists of what each domain covers. This is what EDM covers, the highest level. This is really broad. It just ensure you do everything. That's really what EDM is telling us to do. APO is telling us to have all of the top end management bits that you need in order to have an IT department. Doesn't matter what you do with your IT department. If you have an IT department, you'll need these things sorted out. And the governance objectives here are the things that we have to make sure, make sure we are managing our relationships because we've got goals and we've got metrics. We've got something to check. Why do we have something to check? Because that's what our governance has given us, something to check. And if we don't have anything to check and we're not checking, then we're at risk. And for some organizations, that's fine. And for some organizations, that's absolutely not fine. And that's what governance is there to help with. Build and acquire and implement. That's what it covers. Now, I mentioned a few of them, but that's the list. DSS, service and support, servicing of IT. Incidents, problems. That's the stuff that we know that that's, that's help desk, that's tech support. And monitor, evaluate and assess. It's it, here, here's compliance. Finally, here, here it is. That thing that says comply with the law, that's just this second last one from nearly at the end of our 40 objectives, one little piece. Now I'm going to switch screens and I'm going to show you a couple of things in a moment that, well, now I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to show you the ISACA website because I'm going to show you a PDF and I'm going to show you where you can get your own. So let me show you that first. I'm going to change my share to this, right? So here is the ISACA website. ISACA publishes COVID. So when you go here, you will create your own free digital membership. You don't have to pay anything to become a digital member. When you're a digital member, these two documents, and I've highlighted them in blue, they are free. They are the COBIT framework, the introduction, and, and the details about what all the bits and pieces that go together to make COBIT do its thing. That's what that is. And this one down here, the list of 40 management objectives, that's this PDF. And when you click here, you can download it for free when you have a login, free login. So it's quite easy to get access to all of this, right? Now I'm gonna switch screens again because I'm gonna, I'm gonna give an example of one to look at. Okay, so we are looking at EDM. Here's the first one. Is that too small? Should I blow it up? Anyone, anyone telling me? No, it's it's okay. Too I think it's okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't, I'm not expecting everyone to read all these details. I just want to talk about the ingredients here. What are the ingredients? It has a description and it has a purpose. That's what this objective, ensure that you, this is the top, this is the parent objective. This is the one that governs everything. 
it says here's the enterprise goals that are relevant. He's listing these three, and here's the alignment goals that are relevant. And then it gives the suggested metrics underneath that. Then it has its components. We listed the components before. I know we breezed through it. So, so sorry, here, Brenton, we're getting we're getting a lot of screaming in the chat for some zooms. People want it zoomed? Yes, please. Oh, beautiful. Yep. How is that? Yep, that's probably a bit better. So what these this is, uh, this is the enterprise goals. And this is the alignment goal. So it looks like compliance with laws, uh, in functionality. They, these are in this particular objective, and this is just one of 40. Every one of them that we look, just look at those lists. It's going to have what enterprise goals it lines up with and what alignment goals that objective lines up with. Then it's going to have some processes and I'm going to scroll down and look at process one, evaluate. It's going to have some activities and it tells us what capability level, that's the performance level of the activity. So I'm going to scroll a bit quickly here because it's going to talk about several of these objectives these activities rather. Uh, there's a third one. Monitor the governance system is down here. All right, scrolling further on. Here, here's component B down here. Organizational structures. What COVID is going to advise and recommend us is that, well, here's the three practices that we just looked at. And here's where they think the accountability and responsibility should lie. Now, these are just roles. Uh, doesn't say people, this is roles. Every one of these is going to have related guidance to it. It's going to say, well, if you want more information, look up this ISO or this ISO or this or that. So that's component B. Component C, scrolling again, it gives us guidance as to what information flows in and out. For each practice, what are the information that we need to take in to take into account what is the information that does it produce and you'll notice here that what it produces will feed into over here will feed into other objectives elsewhere in governance so that's component c then you've got let's scroll down a bit further component d what are the people skills and competencies well this gets a little bit generic remember what i said before it was the processes and the information flows that have the most detail. Policy and procedures, it says you need a policy for this. It doesn't tell you what that policy needs to look like. It just says you need a policy on the delegation of authority. You need a policy on governance. And this is the highest level. So as you go through more detailed ones, uh, it'll give more specific guidance. It'll give a component of guidance on the ethics and behavior. These are always good. I like reading these because these are very altruistic. These are the kind of things we'd all wish IT and governance and leadership was all about. They sometimes are. Demonstrate ethical leadership and set the tone at the top. That's what should happen, right? We know that. Here's a governance system that says, hey, this is important. Don't lose sight of this. Lastly, infrastructure systems and applications. So those get a bit limited. I'm going to zoom back out because I'm going to go to another section. One more example to look at. Let's go to here. I'm going to go to the racy section because that's going to list for us. Okay, here we go. Zooming in. So this is BII4. This is the key practices. So this one has nine. This is program management. So this is build, acquire and implement program management. And it says this is all the things you've got to you got to be doing and you've got to be checking these things. Manage stakeholder and major, develop the program plan, do this, do that. Some of this you're going to say, well, that's you, of course you do that. Program management tells us to do that. We have great program management. This governance system is what executive leadership uses 
to make sure that the, pro that the program management that you have in the organization is as good as you say it is. That's their checks and balances. That's them making sure that you actually do have program management being done correctly because there's metrics, there's goals, there's monitoring of what program management is really doing within IT and is it working the way that the executive leadership at the top has asked for it to be working in order to meet the goals of the organization. Keeping in mind that those goals were not created in a vacuum. They were created with the input of all of the people, including many of these roles, who helped executive leadership understand what reasonable goals for program management should exist within the IT department. It's a collaborative process, like any KPIs should always be. But what this system does is sits outside, but still connected to every other component, all the way through the delivery. If you've got ITIL, you know, ITIL's got some checks and balances. Governance is saying, well, show me the reports. You, you get great reports produced by things in ITIL. Governance is what makes sure those reports get read, get acted upon. And that somebody checks to make sure that, yes, it is actually working the way we all need it to. So, I'm going to switch back. Is that, is that document uh, readily available for people? Yes. Could they just Google search it, something? And uh, no, you, you, you need to get it. You need to get it from the ISACA website and only with once you've logged in but you can get mm. a free login to do that. Oh yeah, there you go, Shika. So you, yeah, so you, you need to be able to log in with them and download it from them. Uh, getting it from anywhere else uh, is would be in breach of their intellectual property. So you need to get it from them. So let's do the synergies, then we'll do some questions and see what people have to ask and discuss. Uh, governance and service management, well, governance ensures that what you're servicing is the right thing and ensures that you are properly resourced in order to service that thing. If the governance in the, the corporate strategy says deliver this service, they need to be able to say, well, here's the money that you need. Here's the resources, here's whatever you need in order to do it at the level that we're expecting and needing it from you. Where it works with Agile is, well, certainly the, the BAI, the build, acquire and implement is a domain within governance that is, governance is managing how well we do all that but governance is inherently agile because it's iterative. You have that constant feedback loop. Governance and business analysis. Well, governance makes sure that the strategy is informed, is aligned with IT, and that it can inform business analysis. Some of you might remember when we talked about business analysis last week, we said that the starting point of business analysis is to know the strategy of the organization. Before you go looking for the problem, you need to know where is the company headed? Where does the company want to be headed? And from that knowledge, that higher level of wisdom, you can more easily find the right problem that needs to be solved. And so governance ensures that all of that information is available to the BA and that the BA is aware of what are the goals? What are the metrics? What are we really trying to do? What are we checking for? So that the BA can work within that in harmony. How are we going for questions, Guy? And did you did you want to put a poll up whilst we wait for a few more questions whilst everyone puts their brains back into their head because it's yeah, no worries. The, where they're it's sort of dribbling out their ears a little bit. Yeah, we covered uh, a lot of stuff just then. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'll. <laughs> uh, apologies if if uh, you're getting some issues with my audio. I'm having some huge struggles with latency. You might have noticed I dropped out for a while there. But we'll launch the other poll. Um, what was your favourite or most interesting topic? Of oh, Brenton's four, we've got IT SM, IT PM, IT BA, IT Gov. All four. I can't decide. And we've got about maybe 15 questions in there at the moment. And it's a fairly even split with IT project management 
and IT service management falling behind actually. Something, something to your distance. I wonder if, if that's perhaps related to the broad familiarity that a lot of uh, professionals would have with IT service management mm. and agile in, in general. It's, it's perhaps something that more people will have some baseline knowledge of. So maybe it's because we brought a few more new things for some people with some of the other topics. That would be my guess. Yeah, if you, if you want to give further context, chuck it in the chat. Mm, let us know or, or put it in the forums uh, if, if you, or the feedback. But um, Yeah, right here. Got about 75% voted. Right. Similar numbers. 25 for 3, 4, 5, 3, 4 and uh, all 4. 15-ish uh, for 1 and 2. Oh, and tonight yeah. is the, the winner by a nose. <laughs> That's a good thing, surely. Uh, and we've got a fair few questions that have come in. Um, I'll start from the top. Um, JM asked, is COVID recognised as much as Prince2, PMP, ITIL in Australia as a certification? I would say in my opinion, no. Uh, it's the, the, the problem that the certification for COVID suffers from is that a lot of organizations believe that governance is, well, first of all, they either believe that it's so tailored that how could a generic system like COVID even help us? The short answer to that is that it'll help you make sure that you didn't forget something because if you rely just on clever people, somebody will forget something. And if you have a checklist of all the decisions you have to make, that's a starting point for not forgetting something. The other thing is that a lot of systems like this, organizations think, well, we're not big enough to need that. You're never too small to need governance. You might be too small to do governance separate to everything else. But even in a small organization of 20 people, you're still gonna be making the decisions of what, what are, what's their risk. It's just that in those situations, two people are probably a couple of desks apart and they communicate on a daily basis. So it's very easy to have those discussions you're still having the discussions. So it's not really recognized as much as Prince2 because Prince2 and ITIL and PMP organizations say, well, yeah, like if you know that, we can just plug you in here and that's going to be great. But if you know COVID, how do we leverage that? Well, the short answer is you would know all there is to know at that level about governance, which means that you're a sort of person that can probably do that, but that's not as common. Everyone does projects more often than they do governance. Thank you. Uh, Derek asks, how do you know if an organization has governance? Uh, it, it's sometimes not apparent and visible. And, and, and do you think that should influence decisions other stakeholders make as to whether they engage thoroughly with, with these entities? You can have a level of governance that isn't visible downstream and it's, it's incomplete. When you have governance, uh, a lot of the time it begins with risk. So usually the thing that keeps executives up at night is the risk component. And sometimes their governance will be purely to make sure that risks are being dealt with. And that might be as far as they go. And if that's the case, it won't look like a governance system because you're not gonna have metrics. Until you get governance doing the job of managing performance, and resources and delivering on the strategy until you get to that, you're obviously, you're often not gonna see governance downstream. So the short answer is that the organization is probably going to have some kind of governance, but if it's only managing primarily risk, then it's not thorough enough for you to see it downstream. Now that doesn't mean, it doesn't really answer the question fully because there might be some governance, but not the governance you need. If you can't see it, in, in the IT functions, if you can't see what the metrics are, if you don't know what the strategy is, and that's not made clear, and you don't know what metrics to com comply to or conform to in order to know that you're on strategy, then the governance isn't, isn't there to that extent. Thank you. 
A couple of similar questions, for, one from Joko, one from AJ, who has been Jokoing all night in the chat. Um, how do we get, how do we do the IT governance in the organization? Uh, actually, no, sorry, wrong question. Um, AJ asks, who is responsible for, for governance in, uh, in enterprise and IT in an organization? Where does this team sit? Is it part of a project team or ITSM? Hugh asks, where does it sit within bureaucracy? Are there differences between different types of organizations? So one of the things that is perhaps a, a myth that can be busted for most organizations is that you don't often have, you, you do have some roles that are very governance focused, like you might have a risk officer uh, that is very much uh, a governance function, but you don't have a value delivery officer. That's the CIO. So that's the same role that you would have that just does everything else. You don't have a separate team, like you would have the project management office as a separate team that sits outside of other things. It's not quite like that with governance. You, you might have a couple of roles. You might have auditors that would sit outside of that, but auditors might be consultants that you bring in. So what gets separated is the decisions. You might have the same people that make many business as usual day-to-day -day decisions in the rest of their job. But the point of the governance framework is to make sure that at certain intervals, those same people make the other decisions, which are the governance ones. So it doesn't have to be a separate team. It can, it's all the same people. And that's what makes it integrated and holistic. It's the same people. It's the IT team that does it, all of them. It's all of the leadership that does it to be, to be as precise. And it's the person responsible for it is the CIO. The, the whoever's ultimately at the top of the chain for the IT environment, the executive. In the same way that the CEO is responsible for corporate governance and making sure that you're not fraudulent as an organization, for example. Thanks a lot. Hopefully, Joker, that actually answers your question as well. Um, uh, we'll move on to... Um, Great Zimbabwe University has a question. Uh, thanks for coming along. Um, which, or, or how do we structure the committees and, and perhaps the auditors to ensure in large uh, corporations uh, that we ensure that the governance delivers to its promise? So, so you're sort of discussing auditors being separate. Um, how do you ensure that? So it delivers auditing. to its promise. As an example, auditing is one of the objectives uh, that you have in COBIT. And that objective will provide some specific guidance that says this is the, you need to have qualification. You need to have decided what qualifications your auditors need to have. You need to decide uh, what they get access to. They need to have complete transparency. So how do you make sure? One of the things is that by having a policy from the top, that's written and enshrined that says auditors have access to everything. Have a policy that says, this is how we treat information. If you, have, if you don't have that, then yeah, people can hide information. So the main way that you ensure is by having policies that are then enforceable, which means if someone is not working according to a policy, that's a red flag that gets reported as part of the reporting that says, well, this department, this team, this person, this decision, this activity were not done according to the policy. Now, whoever right, makes that policy should care about that. The accountability comes from the KPIs upstream, like those metrics in the job description of the individuals who have accountable responsibilities according to the RACI. They will have KPIs in their job description that says you need to be monitoring these metrics these performance metrics, amongst all the other things, some of those metrics will be the governance metrics. So in theory, the way you make sure that it happens is the same way that you make sure anyone does their job at all in any other capacity, falls into the same bucket. But it must be endorsed from the executive level. If the executives don't really care, remembering that governance, it's for them primarily. It's for the executives. Because if you waste a million dollars, and you deliver a white elephant or you implement the wrong strategy and the share price tanks, 
and you lose market share, well, there's the executives that get fired. In theory, that's they should. So they're the ones that are going to want to make sure that these tools work. Get a get a goodbye handshake um, with a, a bonus at the end of it or something. Stephen's talking about the way that ITIL and COBIT overlaps, and perhaps we could go back to that slide with the overlap um, visual representation. Um, I thought that was quite interesting. I'm going to close the poll. That one. Yep, that's the one. So I guess that uh, you know, just broadly, in what ways do they over do they inter do they overlap? Uh, would be interesting, perhaps. I'm, I'm particularly well, interested in like the IT governance versus overarching business governance as well. Like um, whether there's any sort of clear differences of of of, um, of emphasis. ITIL has continual improvement as one of its core principles, and to be able to continually improve within ITIL, you have to know how well you're doing you have to ask that question. You have to measure something. And ITIL tells us that. ITIL tells us that we need to be proactively measuring what we're doing so that we're proactively looking for ways to improve. So that, that little piece of ITIL is a gateway and connection back to something like governance. Because governance is also using monitoring and metrics that says, well, how well are you doing? Now, ITIL is saying, well, how well are we doing according to our own KPIs? Governance gives you the KPIs. Governance is the one that says, we want this service to work at 99.9 .9, and we need this service to work at 99.5. Because why? That's, that's what the company has decided we need for a variety of reasons like our competitors and, and the market and what the customers want, et cetera. So ITIL will then say, okay, well, that's what we need to adhere to. And so all the things we do as a system will be trying to reach that. And we will want to know within ITIL with the continual improvement, how do we continually get better at meeting that 99.9, .9, for example? And that's going to feed back and be using similar mechanisms that what governance is going to look at. The guy with your question, how does it, how does it link back to corporate governance? Uh, that's the connection with the goals cascade. That's where you say, well, for all of the things that we are checking with governance, which of the corporate goals, the enterprise goals, is that, is that meeting and making sure that all of the enterprise goals we have, there's something in governance that's checking. Something we do, there's some decisions, there's some metrics that we look at that's telling us whether or not we're on target. Thank you. Uh, Kylie's just wondering, would, would you say COVID is best practice for governance? Um, I think they would like to be. Uh, I, I don't think that they're not the only option. Uh, there's other frameworks. Some of them are niche frameworks. Uh, you get frameworks that have a guidance that are specific, like ISO 27000 for information security. You have TOGAF. Uh, uh, you, you have NIST in particular. And you notice, uh, I, I, you probably didn't notice, but when you look at a lot of the objectives within COBIT, and it says related guidance, often it'll point to NIST. Uh, so NIST, I want to switch over to, if I can show you NIST. NIST is a framework of, of uh, governance and guidance, or has a framework of governance. So NIST is essentially the um, standards organization in the US, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And uh, I'm going to switch to there. NIST has a bunch of pub publications that go into a bit more detail about how to do certain things. And this can get really dry and difficult, and it can be difficult to learn all these details. But COBIT will point to that, where it thinks it's relevant and it thinks it's necessary. So I don't think it's strictly best practice. Uh, you, you probably find that within certain niches, different frameworks will be best practice in those niches. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't do better than 27,000 when it comes to InfoSec uh, and, and the, the, the things that come from that. COVID isn't going to give you better than that. 
for that particular thing, for example. It's a middle of the, middle of the ground, middle of the road framework, I think. Thanks. Uh, got a couple of people asking about the the Isaka Cobit link. Um, don't can't access the there. resources. So maybe Henry, if you could um, type those in the questions about that, and then we can clear those questions. Uh, Fiona and Colleen, for example. Uh, Carl asks, do you see the role of COVID being lost as organizations struggle with digital transformations? I don't see it being lost, but I, I mean, it's recently evolved and it's still lagging behind. Like they, COVID 2019 has was evolved through 2017, published in, in uh, 2019. It's still lagging behind a couple of other frameworks and standards because a lot of this stuff is changing relatively rapidly. ISOs, ISCs often change every five years or they get reviewed every five years. And you, you got the risk, for example, uh, a lot of what COBIT was originally looking at was the 15,504 is now 31,000. And so ISO standards are leaping forward all the time and they're still trying to keep up with what the industry actually needs. So all of these frameworks are gonna be a little bit behind what the industry really needs at any point in time at the moment. I mean, even ITIL, ITIL 4, you look at what ITIL 4 and COBIT 2019 are doing is that they're saying, well, you know, we've got these details, but what we're, what we're broadening is the holistic principles, high level stuff that means that if we don't have an answer, here's what you think about to find your own answer because they know they're not gonna be able to keep up. The, the publication, the review cycle means that the industry changes too quickly. I don't see any of this becoming no longer needed. I just see it always needing to evolve and change and the decisions need to change. But what's not gonna go away is that top executives need a way to make sure that when they tell their uh, shareholders that that's, this is what the company's doing, they need to be able to come back three years later and say, or next year and say, yeah, we did that, or yeah, we're doing that, or yeah, we're not. Super interesting. You could probably extend that to all sorts of IT industry certifications as well, couldn't you? Just everything's in such a state of flux and certifications change so rapidly. They're still worthwhile and they still have their use. It's just a question of whether it's the most contemporary, uh, the extent to which the, the new paradigm actually expands on the the framework or the or the services um yeah i, I don't so, think you can ever sort of say it it's it loses all of its um utility yeah i i, I agree and I, and I think if you link it back to the question about you know certification and how popular is it in my view every senior leadership person in it needs to know a bit about governance and COVID is a great vehicle there's a great spot for them to pop in and say okay why well, let me understand a bit about COBIT and if I do that then I, I know enough about governance so that I can kind of get by with whatever approach my organization has so it's not something where like with project management though you have a distinct profession that this is the governance person generally no in, in my view all IT leadership needs to know enough about governance Thanks a lot. A couple of questions, perhaps a little bit related. Um, how, to, how, how do you do governance with no or little budget? Is it possible from, from Charlo? And Emily asks, yep. if you're you know, working with or within uh, an organization and it doesn't have you know, clear governance, uh, I guess, uh, focus, how do you go about convincing the business to set up governance? So two things. Uh, schedule a few meetings, make, just make the decisions. So get a couple of stakeholders that you know that are involved and put an agenda that lists the decisions that need to be made. And that can start at the, the, the one of the domains, start at DSS, start at, at the ITIL layer. You know, what, 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 is, what are the SLAs? Now, maybe you know your SLAs. Maybe you know what the metrics that you're meant to be achieving. Maybe you know what your KPIs, go up a level. What are our metrics for how our build and project management stuff is doing? Do we have metrics? Like, what are they? Let's let's get a couple of people in a room, have a meeting, or get on a call, or get on a Zoom call, whatever you do. So then you go up to the next layer and say, well, you know, what do we have in terms of managing our 
human resources. Now, when you get, it's just, it's just a matter of having some meetings with your leadership, the existing IT leadership people, and then you'll get gaps in that knowledge. You'll say, well, we don't know what we need to have because we don't know what the strategy is. What is the role of IT in this organization? What, what are we here for? Has that been articulated? Then you say, well, you, you go upstream and you go up to executives and say, uh, execs, we've got some questions. In order to us for us to do a good job here at IT, we'd like your guidance to let us know what's our policy on our risk profile? What's our policy on innovation? What's our policy on HR? A lot of the policies might be there or they might be lacking. But the biggest one is what's our strategy? What's, what's next year? What, what's IT going to be doing? And if they just don't know and they just don't have an answer, then at the very least, you've given them a reason to think about it. And maybe you'll get some answers. Maybe you'll get some, some you, can, you can agitate from within IT to create at least some of the decision-making that governance entails. And maybe you'll get some risk management as well. So what, what risks are you worried about at the top? So th therefore, what risks do we need to worry about? It's just, you don't have to have any money, you just have to have a bit of time and people willing to say, oh yeah, that's an important question. We should have a meeting about that. Uh, let's set aside half an hour. Even that is a start. Good luck. Good luck, yeah. But, but that's what COVID is good for, right? Because you, know you know what to put on the agenda. You know what to yeah. ask. Rightio. Uh, Stephen's asking, is there a COVID level of maturity measure? Of processes okay, I, and activities, yes. Yeah. So ISACA purchased CMMI. Uh, do we, am I still on the website? Are you still seeing the browser? Yep. 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 Okay. So COVID <laughs> is CMMI dead. <laughs> it's one of the questions in the okay. Google machine. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, CMMI is perform is process performance management. So it's, it's a structure, a framework for how to measure the performance of your processes. And that's what ISACA purchased and they've wedged it into COVID. Uh, they already had something that was based on it years ago. So I think they knew they were gonna buy it, but that will is a framework and it's a loose framework, but it's a framework to help you measure the performance capability level of all the processes that you have, any processes that the organization operates. And it has a framework for how do you assess the capability of your processes? How do you improve to the next level? Quantifies them, it, it, it frames all those, codifies it all. So you have something that everyone can get to and say, well, okay, this is where we're at with this process. We wanna to get to the next level. What does that look like? Well, it, that's what it answers. That's what it provides. I, uh, COVID has the bare minimum version of that, but this, the, this whole thing is, is the rest of it. I'm not sure if that's the what the question was really about, but that's that's the best answer that COBIT can give. Okay, excellent. Uh, Tokia, uh, what is BA as in the Synergy slide business analysis? Um, and I think we can answer a question from the chat earlier. Um, the recordings are gonna be there in perpetuity. You never have to worry about them disappearing. Um, and we'll, we'll talk at the end of the Q and A session about uh, I guess the course details, if anyone's super keen to hang around and, and hear about all of that. Hannah, I might get you to start uh, cutting off questions after now. Um, just uh, otherwise we'll be here all night. I'd like to hang around as long as we can though, given it's the final webinar. Thanks. Now, BA, we're talking business analysis. Yep. So that's referring to last week's topic, the IT business analysis uh, function is what that's referring to. Yeah, I think that's what the question was. Yep. Yeah. All righty. A uh, couple of, uh, actually a really interesting question from my high time. Uh, how does artificial intelligence help in governance? Can it be automated? Can it be? The first step would be trending, uh, predict predictability models. You can use machine learning to look at, if you have metrics, 
and you have data points that are being monitored, uh, you can do predictive trends that say, well, you know, we're on track now, but based on what we're looking at, we will not be on track in three months time. Now, yeah, you can have somebody pour over a spreadsheet to try and find that, uh, or you can have an algorithm in AI that already is looking at that every single hour of every single day and will just tell you. And that's the beauty of AI. It's so AI, it's a whole other subject of, you know, what is AI and data science, et cetera. Uh, the great strength of AI in this context is that it's asking the questions, analyzing the data and giving you an answer every single minute. And it'll tell you when that answer is one of the ones that you've said you're interested in. So you don't have to keep checking at all. AI is going to say, well, yeah, we're checking this sort of stuff. And then has the capacity to say, well, yeah, but we're learning from these parameters. You still need to be able to put a lot of setup into it. But I definitely believe that there's a lot of potential with AI and machine learning to automate a lot of the analysis, checking, responding to trends, responding to information that would otherwise be time consuming in governance frameworks. That, that's a minimum starting point that I do think that, but it depends on the, how much data you've got. If you're a big organization with lots of data, uh, lots of measurements, lots of metrics, uh, then it's gonna, you're going to get a lot more leverage and value out of using any kind of uh, intelligent analysis of that data. Thank you. Tracy asks, is IT quality assurance part of IT governance? Does this yes. go back to IT service management as well? Yeah, it definitely does. Yeah, uh, yeah, it lines up perfectly. So quality assurance and, and you know, you get quality assurance in IT service management, you get it in ITIL, you get quality assurance in ISO 20,000, talking about IC service delivery and governance. Yeah, it definitely has in DSS, it, it, it was managed quality. Where is it? We got it. Where have I got it? Where's quality? There it is, APO, manage quality. So in, in here, you're setting quality standards, you're setting quality benchmarks and requirements, you're setting metrics, you're determining how you're going to measure that quality in IT. And not just for closing tickets, but for everything. That's an APO, so that's the top. That's that, so everything you do in IT, there's gonna be things in here that are gonna say, and you know, Quality assurance questions. Make the decision. Doesn't tell you what the answer should be. Tells you you need to make the decision. So yes, definitely all quality assurance can be is, is part of governance. It leads to it. Thank you. Lots of organizations uh, you, you're do talking quality about... assurance anyway. Sorry, sorry, guys. Just saying, you do quality <laughs> okay. assurance anyway. Governance is make sure it's actually good enough, not as good as you think it is. Beauty. Thank you. Uh, going back to something we've discussed pretty much every week, um, but might be worthwhile reiterating. Steve's asking, is, is risk management of IT organization any more difficult than uh, risk management in a non-IT organization? The, the complexity issue that you were talking, you've been talking about every week. I, I think there's proportionality risk. There's a proportionality change. The more IT is either in control of activities or the more IT is dependent upon for the delivery of value, then you have a proportional increase in risk because IT is a powerful leveraging force, both for good and for bad. So if you look at the Google, do, do Google search of some of the biggest breaches of security and then the more an organization is dependent upon that security, the bigger impact it's going to be. So like, for example, uh, you had the Cambridge Analytica scandal that affected Facebook. Facebook's a big organization. And when that broke, the share price of Facebook tanked 12%. Yeah, yeah like they, they recovered and then they got that share price back again. But, but you still have a phenomenon that says they're a purely technology driven organization and something that didn't go well for them knocked 12% off their market capitalization. 
I, I see there's a direct correlation there between, you know, an organization that's purely manufacturing building widgets and all that the IT is doing is managing their finance and their, their CRM is going to be a lot less impacted um, in that regard. Thank you. Interesting question from an anonymous attendee. PMOs generally have good governance around project delivery. Is it cheating for IT management to get changes delivered as projects, inheriting the PMO's governance rather than doing it themselves? I don't think so. I mean, it's a subjective question in the organisation. If PMO is the most effectively governed piece of what you do because your other governance is sort of lacking or limited, then go for it. You know, use that. It's better to have that extra level of of care and guidance that something like a good PMO project management office might offer rather than to do it on the fly and, and cross your fingers. So I don't consider it cheating. Uh, I, I consider that things like a PMO are either an integral part of a governance system or they might be the best part of your governance system. So use them accordingly. Thank you and PMO project management office. Uh, Lance has asked, could I get a view on your perspective on lean on uh, PPM, uh, uh, project portfolio management in relation to construction industry and if this is relevant? So lean in the construction industry, the construction has been around longer than lean. Lean was developed in the 1980s. Uh, as a manufacturing process. Construction has had its own version of, that predates that, which is quantity surveying. And quantity surveying is a concept that says, let's plan and check in advance. Usually you know what you're gonna build. And the point behind quantity surveying is that you're not having any wastage. How many bricks do you need? Like exactly how many bricks do you need? And that's where lean parallels and says, well, lean is about only what you need, only when you need it. If you take and blend quantity surveying with project management and say, well, you know, okay, we need a million bricks for this. Well, we need a hundred thousand bricks by this date. And then we need the next 50,000 bricks on this date, not a day before, not a day after, but on this date, then you're managing logistics and delivery, et cetera. If you're doing that really tight, that's lean at work. It's the principles of lean still applying in that environment. Um, I don't see as much connection back to COVID uh, unless that was a, a nice outlier question to, 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 to reel in some other info. I, I, I might've missed the, the, the connection. Guy, did I miss something else out of that that, that was connecting it back to COVID? How, how, I may have got myself confused now. No, I think it might've just been fishing. <laughs> For yeah, some, we, for some in, as, we're, as we're wrapping up the course, there's a lot of questions. Um, so that's my take on it. I, I think that you have not so much agility, but you definitely have lean having a role to, to, to play in construction. Have I answered that? What else we got? Just a few more? We lost Guy to lag again. We might have lost Guy to lag. Have we? Maybe. All right, I'm going to read the next question. How does Hello. How do, um, it's a question? Yeah, we'll lose it. We've, Guy, I'm carrying on if you can hear me. Um, it's a question how to categorize positive and negative risk. ISO 31000 uh, is really the only definitive standard that we, we look to. There are others. NIST has standards. Uh, there are specifics within other frameworks. Uh, positive risk, it's actually changing. The frameworks a few years ago decided to get really clever and say risk is positive and negative they're actually reviewing that now and thinking well maybe we shouldn't have done that because we've confused like everybody and we should call positive risk opportunity novel idea so uh, that the, the the labels are possibly changing and so i think you will see in the next version of iso 31000 there might be some different words uh, and different uh, categorization but it's there are some very broad generic categorizations. Uh, I don't think they're necessarily very useful because it's only things like you know high, medium, low. 
organizations need to make their own determination of how they're going to categorize risk and they call it colors they kind of got levels you there is no standard formula that we all should follow you get to pick your own Lewis is saying, which uh, IT committee should we have in a large corporate to ensure IT guidance delivers to its promise? So I, I would, it's a bit of a cheating answer perhaps, but I would point straight to the racy guidelines in COVID and say that for each of the objectives, you look at those roles and say, well, uh, you need to get the top accountable roles and put them in a governance committee. So you can have subcommittees and the subcommittees would then be comprised of each role that has an accountability in those objectives. And that would be an untailored approach. You would probably tailor that a little bit, but I think that would be a starting point. But who do you turn to first? You turn to the people that are ultimately gonna be accountable. And then you turn to the people that are gonna be responsible for the things under that and decide who needs to be in those committees because you can't have them too big because you never get the decisions made. And if you've really only got the people that are ultimately accountable, then they have real a real stake in it and making sure that it happens. They're not just looking to have a voice. Uh, another question from H. Taylor. Do you have any recommendations for tools uh, which tie these approaches you've covered over the past four weeks together or tools which fit together nicely to give us a full picture? <laughs> Uh, interestingly, I, no, uh, I don't think so. And if anyone does have a good answer to that question, I would really love to have that posted in the forums and talked about, because that's actually one of the reasons why I crafted this short course. It was one of the, the points behind the inspiration to say, let's look for the synergies. Let's talk about these four areas in ways that align them from a leadership perspective. So I haven't found tools that do that. Now, when you're talking about tools, if you're talking about software, or you're talking about methodologies and frameworks, they really do stand alone. You've got BABOC, the business analysis, body of knowledge, and then you've got project management methodologies, and then you've got COVID and, and Agile and Scrum. And you know each is managed by an organization or, or an entity or a publisher, and they have their own commercial objectives. So they do like to line up. So ISACA and COBIT is very respectful and aligned, not just with ISOs, because they are truly international, but with things like the PMBOX, the PMIs and the PRINCE2s, and they, they do line up a little bit, but they all stick to their own area because they want to sell their niche. So it's getting more aligned, but I'm not aware of any tools, but if you find one, let us know. Well, Brendan, uh, thank you for identifying that there isn't many tools and creating this short course. <laughs> well, that's that's what I was trying to address. So, Stefan's last question. COVID looks like a lot of work for an organization has nothing in writing about it. Where would be a good way to start? So I'll go back, I'll circle back to that question I answered before about just have some meetings. Use something like grab the free PDFs from ISACA about COVID and decide just pick a couple of areas and stick with start with one of the three pillars is it risk is that what you're going to start with is it resource optimization that you want to start with is it benefits and value delivery that you want to start with pick one pick a couple of objectives that say well we want to get some decisions made around this can we do that and a couple of people get together and say yeah look, let's let's do some planning don't even call it governance call it something else if that's a, a threatening label uh, and don't hire people or, or bring in anything else. Just have a few meetings, make some decisions, and you're on the way towards being governed and, and getting the benefits of what governance is trying to do, even if it's only small and ad hoc. It's a step in the right direction. As AJ says in the chat, and, and I must say, thank you, AJ, so much for the constant zingers um bill shorten like in in magnitude um we can all be that tool uh, <laughs> that, that is the bridge between the four yes hey brenton let, let's uh, uh is there like a, a sort of a 
an overarching sort of summary or conclusion, or, or should we just get straight into the uh, exam chat? Do you have any? I have a final slide. Okay. It's a checklist. It's 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 your <laughs> governance checklist for your attendance in this course. Do complete the <laughs> weekly quizzes. <laughs> Do complete the week because let it give us your feedback in the survey. The survey is going live when is it a few days on the weekend, something in a little while? There'll be a survey, should be by Friday. All right, uh, please let us know, uh, answer all the questions, tell us all the good things and all the bad things, and give us all the feedback. We want to keep getting better at this. Uh, if you the forums are still open, you still got things to say, put them in the forums, talk about stuff uh, that doesn't close. And don't, don't forget, if you've got any curiosity from any of this about how you might want to do study through any of this, let us know. There's a forum up there that you can put open questions in, or you can get in touch with IT masters directly and have a conversation about how we can help with your study plans or potential. That was my wrap up. What have you got? What, what else do we have you, to do, Guy? Uh, I suppose we should balance. have a, a, a quick chat about the exam. Uh, right. Which, which will be available by Friday as well. Um, we'll give you all some time to revise each of the, the modules and you'll need to complete the weekly quizzes um, before First. you can unlock the exam. Once you complete the exam and Brenton makes actual exams that test knowledge and require you to actually do some revision, which is always wonderful with these short courses. So um, make sure you, you're prepared because um, you only get one attempt and you only get one hour. And if you log off, your hour keeps on ticking away. Um, so, so do some revision if you, if you want to do really well in the exam. Once we, I guess, have a look at all the questions, make sure they're behaving the way we expected them to. Um, we'll uh, mark all of the exam attempts and the certificates will be released. There's no due date for all of this. It's just that uh, you really should get cracking in the next couple of weeks otherwise you'll just uh you know miss your opportunity to access it while it's all front of mind yes what you can remember uh do it do it then there won't be any questions from the external resources by the way uh, a lot of the questions will be from the webinar there might be some questions from the audio uh, not not a lot but there'll, there could be a few that that are from there so that's what the stuff is up there for so if you want to do really well, uh, you might want to listen to some of those, but uh, certainly the majority of it will be from the webinar content. Excellent. There's, there's a bunch of information on the course page. Yeah, you, can look at, you can look at it there, some FAQs and that sort of thing. Um, I guess all that's left to say is... Sorry, sorry, guys. I was going to say the sample questions. Sorry. That's what the weekly quizzes are for. Someone in the chat was asking about yeah. sample questions and that's what the weekly quiz is help, meant to do, help you get a preparation for what, how we ask things. So that's your sample. Beauty. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much, Brenton, for this course. Um, My pleasure. Geez, it's nice working with you. It's a great thing to do with you guys. It's uh, I have a lot of fun. Yeah, and it, it really does just... Um, yeah, it really is just a lot of fun to, to get have these short courses and make them available to everyone and, and make sure that they're always available. Thank you to everyone who has been so engaged in the chat, um, in the Q&A, in the forums. Um, it really does, I think, enrich the course. Thank you so much to, to Hannah for, you know, just being the person that makes it happen every week. It's, it's, yes, it's fantastic. Yes, thank you, Hannah. Fantastic work. Um, and, and yeah, just you know, you, you really do make these short courses possible because you come and you talk about, you know, the, the further study. Um, and if you are interested, just, just keep on chatting. That forum post is, is there. And there's a couple of posts in there and I'll try and respond to some of the stuff from the chat from last week. Um, so yeah, any questions, chuck them in. But yeah, just uh, Brenton, as ever, I'll leave it to you to sign off and, and everyone has my thanks. Thank you, Guy. Uh, the upcoming, based on the, on the, the poll we just did, digital inf information, uh, data and uh, agile data and information management might be one of the ones coming to you soon. And uh, that'll be me again. So uh, hopefully we'll have some news on that for you in the near future. Keep an eye out for that. We'll certainly broadcast it to you and let you know when it's coming. 
Uh, in the meantime, uh, we hope you're all safe and well and that you're looking after yourself and each other. Thank you for all of your fantastic comments, uh, all the chat, all of the questions that you've all asked, all the posts on the forums. It is a wonderful environment that you all bring to this and I am delighted and look forward to doing it again with you sometime soon. Until then, that's all from me for now. Thank you and good night.